Just to let you know where everybody stands in terms of things, um, we have our lab tomorrow. That's going to be an introduction to seismology, which is why we're talking about seismology today. The lab you're going to get tomorrow is designed to be more or less done in class. Now, for those of you that bugger off routinely, word of warning, I'm not giving you everything you need to know to answer that lab. You have to actually be doing it together. There's a set of series of, of, of example exercises. Once you go through that, then you're more or less okay to go on for the other things. But if you're planning on not being in lab tomorrow, you've got other things to do, you're going to be on your own in that one. Okay? That lab will be due next Tuesday by 5 p.m. It will also be due at the same time as all the other stuff you have to do, including the fence post diagrams is due, okay? Everyone's clear on this. You should be able to get the seismic lab done in class which means it should not be an additional burden to you for the weekend, so to speak. It's going to be the fence post diagram, the top of formation maps, the isopack maps that are going to keep you occupied this weekend, okay? And try to do the best job you can on that. Now, <clears throat> by the way, for the lecture, I'm a little bit behind now where I wanted to be in terms of getting everything updated. Uh, the lecture that we did on Monday is now only now being uploaded to the Vimeo site. I'll let everybody know when that's there, okay? I've added a little bit more on how to do face uh, uh, fence post diagrams because I, we didn't actually, it's very difficult to actually record something like that when I'm running around the classroom. So I tried to do it downstairs on the whiteboard outside my office and I found out very quickly that in order to actually be able to show everything when I'm the only one doing it, it very quickly, you couldn't see anything, so I kind of abandoned that whole thing halfway through it. So that means, for those of you having problems getting going with the fence post diagrams, you might want to take an opportunity during Thursday's lab to catch me between doing the seismic things, okay? Because I tried to show you how to go about doing it, but I don't know if I did an effective job either here or on the video that's going to be online soon, right? As far as today's lecture is concerned, I also have not had a chance to put the, uh, the PowerPoint slides online nor the uh, accompanying handouts. It's not going to be that critical of a thing for today because I'm going to be doing some chalkboard stuff soon, uh, but that will all be online, I hope, later on tonight, and I'll email everybody about that. One last thing, the, lecture, or the uh, online interview I did with that um, former student of ours, I'm going to redo it, but in the meantime, what I'm going to do is record it as an audio-only lecture online. For those of you that are curious about stuff, you can at least listen to it. You know, it's the type of thing you can kind of podcast to an iPhone or something if you want to do that. Okay, and I'm going to try and get that up today as well. So the whole idea is I'm going to try to get caught up on your page um, by the end of tonight, around midnight or so is when everything should be sorted out. Okay? So you got a lot of stuff on your plate that's due in about a week's time. Don't let this get away from me. And if you're wondering, why is everything due a Tuesday at 5 o'clock? Why is everything due a Tuesday at 5 o'clock? Wednesday is the start of Thanksgiving. So I need this stuff over the Thanksgiving break so I can mark it and get it back to you as soon as possible. Okay? So, what? You, there's no classes Wednesday, which is why this is due Tuesday at 5 p.m. All right? Now, if you don't plan on being here Tuesday, then what are you going to do? Get your stuff in at Monday by 5 p.m. The point is that's the last day to get the stuff in, okay? And please do not be late with it. If you're late with it, it's going to be a real problem for me to get it back in time for you, and there will be a lateness penalty associated with this, okay? Questions? All right, wow, that must be one hell of a paleontology exam if it's still going on like this now. Wow. Hmm? I love exams. I love giving them. I love marking them. It makes my day. <laughs> if we could do without exams in this profession, I would love it. But the problem is, the damn engineers need numbers. That's what it comes down to. We need numbers, you know. Maybe we, we should start doing random number things that are perhaps, you could, you know, we'll do exactly like what they do with frequent flyer programs in airplanes. If you are at this level, you get to choose where you sit in the airplane. So we can do the same thing here. And we'll have frequent bribers clubs. You know, if you if you want to bribe on a regular basis, you'll have an opportunity to decide what your grade is going to be a little bit more. All right, you better stop that now before I get myself in big trouble. Okay. <coughs>
Okay, lights are going off. We're going to turn the lights on one more time during this lecture, <coughs> in uh, which case I'm going to ask Diane to record it again because uh, I need to do some chalkboard interpretations for you a little bit later on. But for now, let's get started, shall we? Today we're going to have our first introduction to seismology, which is the next and final phase of what my part of the geophysics course will be all about. This is the stuff that's most relevant to the petroleum industry these days. Now before we um, discuss that, let's again just remind ourselves what we did last time. I tried to give you an introduction to fence post diagrams, what they were. Uh, I gave you some examples of this, and again, there's a whole bunch of different varieties of ways you can uh, illustrate this stuff. The ones I tried to give you were the ones, again, that I thought were most effective at communicating. And then I tried to show you how to make them uh, by running around class, which, again, that's probably an exercise better done in a lot longer time period, like a laboratory. Uh, fence post diagrams, as a reminder, are three-dimensional versions of cross-sections. And again, the nice thing about these things is that they allow you to more or less uh, look in any direction you want to go in. So you can actually flip things around. And of course, these days you can actually get visual renditions that will rotate for you and convert in all different directions. It's a little bit more difficult to show something like that in a, um, in a paper media. But again, if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation in front of a business manager in an oil uh, company, then that type of thing is relatively easy to do. I gave you... Um, this is example is one of the ones I did, and, and again, this is the style that I recommend that you try and do for yours, where you just have a very simple breakdown in terms of, and, and in your case, the formations. Try to maintain the same colors that you did for the formations on your cross sections so that everything has some very good uh, connectivity between the visual medias you're going to be dealing with, okay? Yes, sir? What's the very top of that? The oh, that's just the erosional contact. Okay, so uh, you can if you want to, but uh, not. It's not really that necessary here because you're dealing with subsurface things. So it's not like the that's the end of the exposure. That just happens to be the top of your well logs. So if I were you, I wouldn't worry about putting tops or bottoms on this. Just correlate the middle parts, kind of like what you see here. Okay, leave this stuff hanging. The last formation should be hanging because that way it does. It's not misleading. Try to avoid misleading. And besides, the fewer co actual correlations and contacts you have, ultimately the better it's going to be in terms of clarity. And that's my humble opinion anyway. But again, you guys have free reign in how you do this in terms of the orientation as well. Now here's today's uh, introduction to seismology, and it is going to be an introduction. What I'd like to do is just more or less have a nice little quiet transition going from uh, the well logs into looking at what will ultimately be seismic stratigraphy. And that's where the real bread and butter of the petroleum industry is these days. We're going to have one more con uh, connection to electric logs. Because the one log I haven't told you about yet, one of the three porosity logs, is the sonic log. And sonic logs allow you to more or less determine seismic character within wells, which you can apply to regional seismic sections. And I'll show you how that works uh, as we get through this lecture, okay? So for today, we're going to talk about general stuff about seismology, in particular the problem of resolution versus depth of penetration. Okay, that's a real issue and if, uh, if, if you've done anything in terms of, um, uh, of interpretation of seismic lines, you've already run into some issues with this. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. And then lastly we're going to just more or less talk about some of the techniques, marine versus terrestrial things, uh, which is actually scattered in throughout most of the lecture itself. Seismology! And this does include uh, seismic stratigraphy and ultimately sequence stratigraphy. They all kind of overlap in terms of their interpretation. It's one of the ways that geologists have where we can resolve the subsurface. Now, we've already done that in several different techniques. The combination of what I've told you about and what uh, Dr. Connors has told you about has more or less showed you different techniques that can be used to do the subsurface. This one is the technique that uses seismic waves acoustic waves, sound waves, whatever you want to call them, that allow you to start looking for transitions in the subsurface. The nice thing about this, as you are going to see, is that it really doesn't care what kind of rocks you're dealing with. There are issues, as you know, with magnetics, with gravity, that you really have to start dealing with rocks that have a lot of fairly strong differences in properties. Seismic stratigraphy is capable of resolving more subtle variations provided that you understand the difference between resolution and, um, and, and penetration, okay? So this is a very good technique by which to do very large scale determination of subsurface geology. But that's what you're going to get. So this is what you've got to be able to interpret in terms of things, okay? 
The one of the reasons why this is a technique that's favored by uh, petroleum companies is that they can do large scale analysis over very large regions. It's relatively quick and relatively inexpensive, but notice the relatively on the slide here is underlined. Relatively for an oil company uh, is not necessarily relatively for you and me. Okay, this is not the type of thing that is easy for you as a small mom and pop operation to go and commission. Although there are different shall we say qualities of equipment that do different things for you. We for example have geophysical equipment in this department. Sadly I don't think it's in working operation anymore. The stuff works but like so many things when you don't use it on a regular basis you don't have the mechanism by which to generate revenue to update things. So if I'm not mistaken we have seismic equipment that is being powered by a Commodore 64 computer or so, I mean something equivalent to that. It's, it's archaic. In fact, that's the reason why we've just gotten rid of a bunch of our expensive equipment. The XRD is gone. The ICPS is on its way out. <clears throat> it's not that the equipment is not working, although in the case of the ICPS it wasn't. It's because in order to get it updated, we would be spending about as much money to replace parts as a new one would cost. And the new ones are really, I mean, we can get an XRD that's this big. Did you see the old XRD we had in Ponder's lab? I mean, that was huge. XRDs now will sit on a tabletop. It's about the size of a bread maker. And I want one. Oh, I want one so badly. We put a grant in to try and get some new equipment, as you'll see. And one of these days, we really have to start getting into the seismology side of things again. Okay? Anyway, so let's talk about the techniques that are available. Seismology uses acoustic waves. And again, these are synonymous with a lot of different terms. Shock waves, sound waves, seismic waves, they all mean the same thing. Basically what they are, are a signal that is emitted from some sort of a source and will penetrate different types of rock layers. And the way they respond to differences within those rock layers are recorded by a second device and then ultimately are left for us to actually interpret. Now, I always start off when we're talking about this type of methodology with a simple device like a fish finder or a depth sounder or something that many of us have actually had some experience with. It's one nice thing about living in the Gulf Coast, just about everybody's been in a boat fishing at one time in their life and everybody has a device that allows them to find the fish. So basically you're using the same type of thing. Essentially what happens is you have some sort of a transducer which is an emitter of the shock waves. Now the shock waves in this case may be a simple sound wave, sometimes people call these pingers, you don't normally hear them because they're being emitted from the bottom of the boat, but every once in a while, if you're watching bad movies, you can hear them. They're in submarines, it's the ping, ping, ping. That type of sonar is basically using the same type of approach. Okay, You put a sound wave through the water and you listen for the echo. The echo, or the reflection, is received by the transceiver. Now these days, fish finders have these units built in the same thing. I mean, you can go to Walmart by a fish finder, it's about this big, you put off the side of your boat and, I mean, away it goes. In the good old days, when these things were first starting to be developed, I mean, they were, they were the size, I mean, they put them on naval vessels because they were huge things ultimately, okay? So, so basically, it's all the same type of methodology. So, getting the fish finder thing up here on the screen, th th now we can start talking about the problem that we have with this. If you're dealing with a fish finder, fish finders are designed to look for fish. So basically what they do is, as they're emitting the signal downwards, if they encounter some sort of a density difference in the water, basically they will bounce back and you'll get them. Now they're, they're calibrated in order to actually look for that type of pulse. They also can pick up the bottom of, this, uh, of the sea fairly reasonably. In fact, we often call these things depth finders and things where you can actually see how the bottom is because again, that's a very sharp surface. But the signal that you're using is incapable of doing any penetration whatsoever. That's the problem. If you want to be able to actually see the subsurface, then you're not going to miss the fish. And that's a sad thing for those of you that plan on working in a seismic vessel and thinking that as you're pulling these damn things around the ocean, every once in a while you can throw a fishing line in where there's a big pulse of fish in the sea, isn't going to work because fish are invisible to this type of technique. It all has to do with the resolution penetration issue that affects all types of seismology. 
So here's how it works. This diagram is a very simple graph that actually links three different parameters. On the bottom, we have the frequency in kilohertz. And notice this is log of frequency. This is the frequency of the seismic waves or the sound waves that you were emitting. On one axis, we have penetration. Penetration is the depth in which the seismic waves are capable of penetrating through the sea floor into the subsurface. So we have 15 meters at the top here, going down to 1,200 meters at the bottom. This is obviously dealing with just a very small component of the whole seismology thought side of things. We have, I mean, for example, we have seismology thing that can penetrate down to basically the mantle. On this side, we have resolution going from 0.1 meters, 10 centimeters, down to 5 meters. Now the resolution is the size or the thickness or the sh more or less the extent of a particular bed that you can resolve. Here's what you end up getting. Almost all of the devices you have plot within this region and all of them have a shift in this direction. So basically what this means is that if you want to get depth, if you want to see what's deep below the surface, you're going to be giving up resolution. And this is a serious issue. Okay. Now here's what I mean by serious issue. If you want to resolve the surface with some very fine channels, say that look like this. So here's basically the water. This is the subsurface. We have channels at the surface, okay? If you want to see this, you're going to have to sacrifice anything that's below this level. Because this particular frequency, if you want to get things that have a very tiny resolution, you're going to lose the depth of penetration. Alternatively, if you're interested in what's going on in the subsurface, this whole interval through here is not going to be resolvable, or at best might give you something that looks like this. It's a trade-off. What do you actually want to resolve? Okay, so this is a high resolution. Low penetration. Actually, shallow penetration. And this is low resolution, deep penetration. Now, the reason is because of physics. It's just you have to you're stuck with that. But what it ultimately means is that when most companies are doing detailed seismic analysis, they're running what are called multi-beam analyses. They're running more than one device at the same time. And this is okay because each of these devices is geared up for a certain frequency. So they're more or less independent of one another. Right? So here's the types of things that you can actually put together. Uh, these are the names that they have. Some of these are commercial names. Some of these are just general concepts. So down here, for the thing, the scale of the petroleum companies, 2 and 3D seismic are up in this range. You get very poor resolution. Look at this. That's 100 meters resolution. That means a 100 meter thick bed is the minimum that you can resolve at these scale of things in some situations. But here's the actual penetration. These things can go down thousands of meters ultimately. Okay. So from the point of view of differences between academics and industry, Industry can afford to do these things. Academics, not so good. And most universities that have a marine geology component that do this type of thing usually have devices that are down in this range. Stuff, incidentally, that also tends to be smaller in scale. So you can put it on the back of a standard research vessel that's probably a converted fishing vessel. An oil company can hire whoever they want. Because remember, although this is going to cost them a fortune, if they're resolving the petroleum potential over an area of a couple thousand square kilometers, what they're doing is finding potentially dozens of possible places where they can drill, which ultimately means it's really cost effective. Once you find the areas that you're interested in, then you can start doing some more detailed analysis, including perhaps drilling on site. Um, cost is a factor, and I mentioned cost, so I should probably actually give you an idea of how much this costs per day or hour. And I mean, this is just a relative thing, so there's low cost, there's high cost, and of course there's object detection and side sense. And there's where we see multi-beam 
side scan, and various things are up here. All right. So when you're dealing with an operation like this, it's very high cost. And, in some, and I, I suppose I should say that in some cases, you, if you're an oil company, even then you may actually have to limit some things in terms of what you can actually do. <coughs> okay, now for a series of slides that are here primarily for you guys to look at afterwards, okay? I don't expect anybody to be writing this down or reading it as we go through this, okay? I'm going to just leave this up here and just show you how these things are actually done in terms of the analyses. So when we're dealing with marine seismic analysis, and this is the cheapest way of doing these, we can do this on land. All right, but in the seas, it's a lot easier because basically you can go wherever you want. These marine surveys, which are going to be multi-beam surveys, involve a fairly large vessel, which is towing, in some cases, a fairly large line of, um, of, of devices behind them. The typical marine seismic vessels that they use are fairly large uh, craft, maybe 250 feet long. So they are designed to go out for many days at a time. They'll have restaurants on them, well, them cafeterias on them. They'll have sleeping quarters. They'll have a captain and a first mate who are both capable of doing this. Because once you get out there, you want to keep going 24 hours a day. They will be towing behind them a very large line of objects. Uh, they will have different devices. These are guns. These are essentially the transducers, which are emitting signals. And behind this will be various devices that will be recording things, or in some cases, again, emitting signals. And at the base, uh, back of this, will be some sort of a buoy. Actually, in some devices or some lines, they actually have these strategically placed along the lines. Some of these seismic lines are miles long. In fact, I've talked to fishermen before, and this is one of the funniest things. They're sitting there just kind of fishing, minding their own business, and all of a sudden they see this buoy just kind of floating past them, maybe like a couple hundred feet away, just moving along on its own. And then they look off in the distance, and way off in the distance, just behind the curvature of the earth, they actually see the tow vessel. All right? So these things are really long devices, ultimately. Here's a picture of one of them in operation. And notice, not only is it a line, but it's a series of lines all being towed behind. This is a fairly large vessel. It's got a, he um, a helicopter pad on it as well. And it will just go basically back and forth over the direction until it maps out the whole area. So this is towing one, two, three, four. Actually, it's towing one, two, three, four, five, six separate lines. And these are probably marker buoys on the side of it. So you need a lot of power to be doing this. In fact, you also not only need power, but you actually need to have the hydraulics at the back of the ship. So, so these are, are fairly large devices. Uh, some of the seismic stuff that we'll talk about in the, maybe the last lecture of this, uh, my part of the course, deals with more of the academic issues. Some of the side scan sonar that's been developed that's capable of, of, uh, of actually resolving hundreds, I mean it, hundreds of kilometers across on each pass. It's been used to map out the continental shelf and the deep ocean parts around continents. These things are so massive and so big that the only way you can tow them are actually in vessels that basically only the Navy has. And I know that the Australian government, when they were mapping out their coastline, more or less used a naval vessel. They put academics on it to actually operate the thing. They just towed that around the entire country. That was a cool survey. That particular side scan sonar device, I think, was 60 feet long. All right, and they were towing that through the water, and it was it was heavy. So even this thing actually had to be shored up and um, and retrofitted. Uh, one last thing here, uh, again showing you an idea of the the different arrangements that can be done on. This is just showing you this the scale of things and all. Okay. Now in terms of what this ultimately is going to be doing. It's recording data. The data is going to be recorded on computers on the ships as it's being towed. This is the first primary stage of data analysis. After this is done, of course, the computers are going to be in, um, more or less interpreting things and spitting out the data in a series of seismic lines. There's still a lot of work that has to be done on this. Don't think that this is going to be something that's going to come out perfectly ready to go. There are always going to be complications. And in some cases, you get some really weird interference patterns, some of which you're going to see in the exercises I give you uh, in, uh, in the lab session tomorrow. Okay, So this is not the end of the story. It's just the start. But you have to admit, the way this data is collected is really kind of cool. I mean, I, this is one of the times I'd love to work for, for one of these, these uh, seismic companies just sitting on the boat, sitting there drinking coffee, watching the lines come through on a nice sunny day. Yeah, right. They go 24 hours a day, rain or shine, stormy or otherwise. I don't think I'd like that. 
Oh, okay, what's this all about? Oh, this is ba oh yeah, this is essentially showing us <coughs> the next phase of things. Okay, so here's here, here's what's going on. This is a, a, a two ship uh, seismic line here. So we have one that's um, um, emitting the source, and what's this case is these being uh, uh, acoustic waves are making down through the surface that are starting to bounce up. This is a style of thing that can be done. This is the style of thing that we often do when we're doing on land types of seismic uh, uh, devices. But basically what we have here is a source. These are a series of geophones. Usually they're going to be dragged along, not sitting in place like this. But it gives you an idea that what we're dealing with are still seismic waves that are equivalent in some cases to S&P waves that travel through rocks. We can record these waves as they travel through the rock, and they're going to be places where they're going to be bending, reflecting, etc. And that's ultimately what we have to start talking about now in terms of the physics of how seismology actually works. Now, before we do that, I mentioned uh, seismic surveys, marine surveys. Uh, this is the uh, one area, I believe this is off the coast of Australia. <clears throat> I would have showed you the Gulf Coast area, but there are so many seismic lines that when you actually see a map showing where the seismic lines are, it's black. I mean, they just go over top of one another. So going to an area that's a little bit less intense gives you an idea of how this all works. Everything you see here, with the exception of these red lines, I think these are shipping channels, are seismic lines off the coast of, I believe, Eastern Bass Strait. So this would probably be off the coast of New South Wales uh, in Australia. Notice, got some very dense areas, got some that are not so dense. Very quickly, just by looking at a map like this, you can get a feel for where the areas where there's already been a show of promised oil production are and where the others that are more of a wildcat approach or where there's more of an exploratory thing. Okay, so for these things that are way out here, they're obviously just kind of getting a feel for things, but when they find something that's interest, that's where they go in and redo the surveys and start doing some more detailed work. And yes, there's a whole bunch of lines that are over, over, overlapping this point. If you look at anywhere around the world in the continental shelves, you will see densities like this because every country is concerned about their resources. And in some cases, they encourage the oil companies that are operating in their countries by giving them tax breaks to do exploration off the coast. Once they find it, of course, that's a different matter entirely. Okay? Yeah? These are just different seismic lines. They all have to, have to do with uh, this criteria often through here. So different companies, different uh, different types of, of, uh, of devices, et cetera. Yeah? Uh, if they're doing marine surveys, do they have a correction for like, you know, storms and you know, big waves? They, there's a whole bunch of corrections they have to do, and yes, there is some reason to do that. I've seen some surveys where you can actually see every seismic line is doing this. Those are uncorrected. But again, consider the resolution. If you're going down thousands of feet, all right, at best, you're getting 50-foot waves at the top. 50 feet over that interval is not going to be as much of an issue as some other problems that they have. Uh, they, they tend to have some ghost reflections periodically, which is much more of a concern to them. So, so the computer techniques that they use are more applied to um, correcting uh, the, the larger errors. That's a small error overall. Okay. All right, so how does it all work? Now with this, I'm going to, um, Diane, if you wouldn't mind uh, turning the camera back on again, I'm going to turn the lights on. Everybody blink here for a second. <coughs> Now, assuming that this is our surface, and I, I don't care if it's a marine surface or if it's a land surface, that's irrelevant, okay? So there's our surface. Below the subsurface, we are going to have a series of geological contacts. Now, each one of these things is going to be a different type of rock. Now, what the rock is, again, doesn't really matter. Let's assume now that this is going to be limestone. Actually, yeah, we'll make this the top, we'll make this limestone. Shale. And then down here, dollar stone. And you got to remember, okay, since we're dealing now with the petroleum applications, the uh, the rock types we'll be talking about are going to be those ones that are most interested in the petroleum companies. I don't care about basalt, granite, stuff like that. Although you will see that from time to time, depending on how deep the penetrations actually are. So what happens now is you have a source of seismic waves here, which are emitted with wave fronts that are now trans 
are they're moving down through the older bird, whatever it happens to be. When you get to different contacts, what's going to happen is there's the potential for reflection to take place, in which case that ray will bounce back off in that direction. But there's also going to be energy that is transmitted through the next rock layer itself. Okay? So in this case, you're going to see the rays continuing to go down. But there's going to be a certain amount of wave refraction depending upon the nature of the rocks. So reflection from surfaces and refraction through layers. Now the thing to note is that what's going to be controlling this amount of refraction is going to be essentially a combination of the density of the rocks as well as the speed in which the waves are traveling through. Now in this case we have to introduce this concept. Oh, I'm running out of room already. Acoustic impedance. Impedance. This is defined as the velocity of the waves, that's the seismic waves, times density of rock. All right, we don't, for some reason, we don't use specific gravity. I guess in this case it's just because it's physical, units are going to be important on this, okay? So acoustic impedance is equal to the velocity, it's actually called the internal velocity of the waves, internal velocity through the rock layer, uh, times the density of the rock. And that's the important thing. So if you're dealing with a rock that is not very dense, say uh, a shale, a shale has an acoustic impedance of 2,700 meters per second, etc. cetera. Uh, the most dense of dollar stone here might be 3,500. What you'll find is that you're going to get changes in terms of how the waves refract. So you might have something like this versus something that goes like this in terms of wave refraction. Between each of these, we are going to see reflections coming back up to the surface as well. And they'll be actually refracted in different directions too. The thing that gets really interesting is that you can all have reflections internally as well. Now every time this occurs, there's a diminishment of energy there will be waves coming up from each one of these as well. Now you can go into a lot of detail about this, but when you're dealing with physics, normally they'll talk about this as being R, this as being R1, R2, R3, etc. in terms of keeping track of things. Now, for you and me to keep track of this, of course, this gets to be very complex. We would not be able to do it. But computers are designed to do this. At the surface, of course, we've got a series of devices that will be receiving the signals. These are the geophones. Or if you're on a boat, these are the transceivers. Each one of these things is sitting there very quietly, timed according to when this ping is fired. And what it's doing is just listening for the echoes and echoes and echoes. Time all together because they are all linked together, then they can more or less somehow keep track of how all these signals work. Okay? So far so good on this in terms of stuff? Let me show you how the signals actually work. So I'm going to have to erase this. Has everyone got this? One of the issues of being limited to chalkboard space is that we have to erase things on a regular basis. In fact, I've always argued that what we really need to do is have a projector on one side, chalkboard on the other side, and not overlap the two of them like that. So this is annoying. All right, so here's ultimately how this is going to work. This is time equals zero. This is when the ping takes place. Over time, what we're going to find is we're going to have a series of geophones. So we're going to have geophone one up here, geophone two, and then geophone three. Now remember, these are the signals that are going to be received from each of the geophones over time. Okay? So 
Geophone 1, after the ping, is closest to the source of the ping, might look like this. So that's the actual reflection. If you wish, this is the incident wave that caused it all in the first place. Then what we're going to find is that over time, we get this type of pattern. This records one. That's the reflection from that first contact. This is R2. And this is going to be actually from the contact with the next walk layer down, R3, etc. And it will go on and on and on. Notice the energy is diminishing over time, right? Because every signal that's bouncing back off of the surface is going to be weaker overall in terms of the signal. Geophone 2 might have a signal that looks like this. Geophone 3 Center. Now each one of these is recording, there's the incident wave again, there's incident, there's R1, there's R2, so R1. What you're looking at now is the time distances between them. If this is where your ping was, the geophone that's closest to the pinging source will receive the signals first. What will happen is, over time, Actually, I kind of screwed that up, didn't I? I missed one of them. But you get the idea. <laughs> That's something, something like this. They're all going to be related in a distance. Now, while this looks like all you're going to be getting is essentially the same thing, this shifted, you have to remember that this is just the first ping. The second ping is going to be showing you different things. Over time, if you put these all together and overlap each of the reflections after each seismic wave, what will happen is you're going to start to see downward transitions. That the distance between these two may not be consistent with the distance between these two because from a slightly different angle, from a different area, they may be thickening and thinning further down below the surface. That's not the easiest way of explaining things, but the idea is if you've got a rock that in the subsurface is thinning like this from one point to another, then if you take your signals along here and shift them consistently and laterally, then the distance between these two, based upon this pattern, is going to get shorter over time. So the net result is, the more lines you have, the more geophone signals you have, all put together, after a while you're going to start seeing this separation getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And of course, if you know how to interpret that, then ultimately these signals allow you to make this determination in terms of what this geology is actually doing below the subsurface. Now this is the concept. This is how the system is supposed to work in terms of layout. In reality, this is not going to help you and I understand how the vertical thicknesses are changing because it's designed with time in this direction. What we really need to do is put depth in this direction. To do that, these different seismic lines are arranged vertically. So once again, here is geophone one, two, three. I'm going to add a fourth one here now. Okay. Now I showed you different kicks. So here's the type of kick you get, followed by one that does this. Okay. The next one. Does this, the next one, does this, the next one, does this. There's one bed, that first contact, the big one at the very top, and here's the other one there. And notice I have now started to intentionally show you that there are lateral changes. Geophones one, two, three, and four. The thing to note is, when you are doing this for real, 
you've got a ping going off maybe every 10 seconds. Each one of those pings is going to result in a series of reflections that are being picked up by the computer. The speed in which you do it is not much of a factor because the computer is a lot faster than you at keeping track of things. If this is separated over a distance of maybe 50 feet, and your seismic line is a thousand feet long, you don't have four geophone signals, you have hundreds of them. Net result is the separation you see here is never this far apart. The separation is more likely going to look like this. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. You get the idea? They can be overlapped like crazy. In order to make this easier to understand, what they do when they're doing this type of thing is get rid of all the vertical lines. What you want anyway are the contacts. So all you want are those little inflections like this. Inflections going this way, inflections going this way. That's what you, res what you more or less preserve. They also color code these things. In the good old days, what they would do is they would color any positive kick going in that direction, they would color half of the curve in black. So every one of these things would be colored black. In that direction, they wouldn't color them at all. The net result was when you got a lot of these things all overlapping, like this, what you'd end up having is a very sharp black line with these. The white ones of the areas that were going back the other direction would be white. So black and white patterns. Nowadays what they do is they color code them red and blue for strong and weaker uh, kind of reversals and all, okay? So this is all you need to do to get rid of all the noise, all the overlap stuff. Net result is, when you finally do get seismic lines, what you'll end up getting are a bunch of lines that look like this, that are either black or white, red or blue, and if you get good at interpreting them, what you're actually gonna be able to decide is what the geology is ultimately about. I showed you one of these very simple seismic lines at the start of this. Basically, it was based upon how all this stuff is working. Okay? So far, so good on this? Now, what you also have to realize is <clears throat> this has got to be linked into geology. You can't just simply have a bunch of squiggly lines all over there unless you know what those squiggly lines actually are. So what you need to do is to go somehow from seismic lines back to well geology. And of course, since we don't really have anything but electric logs, ultimately that's the same thing as saying electric logs. How do we actually make the transition that links together the detailed, I can't believe I'm saying this, the detailed geology that we know from abstract well logs? I mean, really, at this point, that's the detailed stuff. How do we go from that to this more abstract stuff. And the trick is we have to figure out what the seismic response is at the well level. And then from there, correlate it to larger scale seismic lines. This is where we get in the so-called sonic logs. Okay, and with that, Diane, could you kill the camera? And we'll go to the next part. I got five minutes left to do this? I better hurry. Uh, okay, that's basically what I just showed you how it all works here, so I'm not going to worry about that. All right, here is what you do, okay? We have a device, a sond, that basically sends out a seismic wave as it's being pulled up through the well. So in other words, you can determine the character of the, si of the acoustic impedance of each of the wells, uh, log, uh, uh, formations as you're pulling through it. <coughs> okay, so here is how it works. There is basically a sonic log, and what you're going to see is just shifting back and forth. What it's doing is showing you rocks that have higher and lower acoustic impedance. The more that it shifts in one direction, the higher the contrast is between contacts. All right, so here you can see it going back and forth like this. What you do here is you take this, apply it to the density log, okay? So I, I said acoustic impedance. I meant to say that this was just the, uh, the sonic log. You take it to the density log, and from this, you can determine what the acoustic impedance is. You get to this type of relationship, and from here, you can convert it into the way seismic lines deal with 
this. So in other words, from here, you put it through a computer that more or less sorts it out and comes out with this. It gives you a very little small strip of what it would look like if you shot a seismic line directly over top of where the well actually was. Ultimately, that's what you want is this type of relationship. And here you can see this is old school stuff, coloring black half of the deflection in this direction, leaving it white in that direction there. Okay? So from the point of view of the actual logs with a little bit of color coding, right? so here's our uh, gamma ray, this is our sonic log. That's the geology, which we don't have to worry about this time around. That is the artificial or synthetic seismic that is generated from here. And here you can see there, they color this red, they color that blue, and the whites are kept as transitions through here, okay? So that gives you a strip of what the signal would look like if you were drilling, or if you were doing a seismic line right over top of the well. Now I hope you can see where this is going, because what you end up getting is a strip that more or less does this, But more importantly, because you already know what the contacts are, you know that this is the character of, say, the Waikato sandstone. You know that this is the character of the Capello. And now what you do is you try to match what you see here with what you see in the pattern there. In other words, you simply match them up. Big problem. Serious problem. Because this has depth control. These things have depth to them, but the depth here is associated with the travel time through the rocks. And didn't we already say that the waves are going to pick up and slow down with time? That means that the depths here are not consistent. That might represent a thousand feet, that might represent a thousand feet. That's a dramatic difference. But the point is that there is no consistent thickness scale on the way down. It's all two-way travel time. That means you can't simply take this, reduce it to what the scale is, and match things up. You physically have to match up the pattern of seismic responses to each of these different layers. And realizing, of course, that since these contacts are going to be based upon primarily density differences, if a rock should happen to change character from point A to point B, suppose you've got a really beautiful pure limestone over here, but as it goes in this direction it gets shalier and shalier and shalier. Shales have a lower acoustic impedance than a really good limestone does. If you have something that has a very sharp contrast, in other words you have a shale over top of a limestone here, you're going to get a very sharp contrast. You'll see that in the seismic lines. But as you go in this direction, shale on top of shale has less contrast between them. The contacts get weaker and weaker and weaker. Net result is some of these things will actually change character and may fade out and be gone after a while. If you took your well here, it may not be possible to match that contact further on unless you actually do the correlations on the seismic line. And indeed, you can actually go backwards on this. If you do the correlations and you say that there should be a pinch out between a particular formation somewhere else, well, that's one of the ways you identify where there's going to be changes, okay? All right, uh, there's the actual interpretation. Um, now, I'm out of time, so let me just, again, summarize where we are because several people walked in fairly late today. Thursday's lab, Tomorrow, we're going to be doing our first introduction to seismic interpretations. There's two parts to this exercise tomorrow. First is me walking you through the different stages. The next part is you actually doing the exercise. It's an easy thing that should be able to be done in class. This will be due next Tuesday, 5 p.m. As will all of the previous assignments for that long well log thing. Everything is due Tuesday by 5 p.m. Please do not be late. That is the break between Thanksgiving and the last part of the course. All right, um, Les, I got your stuff up here and Cole never showed up today, okay? So I got your test up here. We will see you in lab tomorrow. And I'll get the web pages online as quickly as I can, okay? I'm working on it now. Everybody blink. There you go, dude. Diane, once again, thank you very much for your...